first of all, I just want to kind of go back to the night of the assassination. You were working patrol on Riverside when it happened, correct? Yes. What do you remember on the scanner, on the patrol car that night? Well, just simply a call that there had uh, been a shooting and that Martin Luther King uh, had been shot. And, of course, I knew exactly where it was, and I was only a few blocks away. I mean, you flip and turn. And I was making, in the process of making an arrest uh, at the at particular time. I had been actually accosted by a car loaded with what later on turned out to be what we called the invaders group. And uh, I had pulled them over and went in the process of having a car come to pick them up when uh, the mayor passed by, Mayor Loeb. And, uh, I just pitched him a shotgun that I was holding. I said, hold these guys, the car's coming. Uh, Martin Luther King's been shot, and I'm going to make the scene. I'll let you know. He said, I'll let you know. Communications was not like it is today. We didn't have the cell phones, and it was all uh, talking to the dispatcher at the police department, the sheriff's department. And so anyway, I make the scene, and uh, immediately uh, uh, saw what was happening. One of my deputies uh, pointed to where they thought uh, the assailant had been hiding or shooting, and I walked there in front, and I saw the suitcase and the rifle standing, uh, lying right down on the property, and, and uh, from there, we, uh, we took over the area. Then I walked around back to the, where I met uh, Claude Armour, who was special assistant to uh, uh, Buford Ellington, the governor at that time, and Jesse Jackson, uh, waiting, and they were taking uh, uh, Dr. King away in an ambulance. Uh, so that's that was a started the start of a very hectic night all over the country, uh, riots and and burnings and lootings and what have you. So it was a, it was a, a very interesting evening. What do you remember? Uh, did did you see Dr. King actually going on into the ambulance car? Were no. you, you you was already no. in the car yeah. at that yeah. point. They moved very quickly, uh, bringing them there, and and one of the reasons why we had had. Uh, one of the TAC, what they call the TAC units, there were three vehicles loaded with highway patrolmen, policemen, and, and uh, sheriff's deputies that were cruising the city, and they had stopped right next door uh, to that by the fire station next to where James L. Ray was staying, and where the shot came from. And with all of that, it created a great deal of excitement, man. People went everywhere. And I guess that's why there were some people saying, uh, hollering that, uh, the police had shot Dr. King. There was so much confusion there, but uh, it uh, it was a while settling down. Yeah, and what do you remember most about kind of the subsequent days? Obviously, there were riots in Memphis. There were the curfews. What do you uh, what kind of scene do you remember that like in the immediate aftermath of that? Well, it was like it was all over the country. You know, major cities all over the country. There was a, an outbreak of violence and what have you. So it required. Uh, every city to react to what was happening. The good thing about Memphis, because we had had the sanitation strike building up to this day, we had already brought in the support system uh, to deal with any violence that might occur, thinking it might occur as a result of the sanitation strike. Uh, had little did we think about the possibility that there would be an assassination on Dr. King. So. We, we came out better uh, than most cities because we were able to activate all of the units that we had, including the National Guard, Arkansas Highway Patrol came in, I deputized them on the bridge and activated all of them all within a short period of time. And it's kind of fast forwarding to June 9th, James Earl Ray is arrested in, in England, um, but he wasn't you know, brought to you until this day 50 years ago. Right. I guess so that was about a month and a half. What do you remember about that time? There must have been, I imagine, a lot of coordination of, between it, it, the authorities there. It, it really was. And of course, I made several trips to Washington and uh, Albert Gore Sr., Senator Gore, and George, George McGovern, Senator, and a number of people in the Congress, along with the Vice President Hubert Humphreys, were very instrumental in trying to coordinate all of the services of the Justice Department and Ramsey Clark with the, with the Attorney General, was Attorney General, of course, and the, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, uh, Mr. Clark. Uh, we had a, a number of people, a number of contacts that we had to make in order to put together the idea of how we were going to handle uh, James Earl Ray when he was brought into the country. Uh, 
And it was, a, it was quite a chore. And of course, the preparation in Memphis was significant, uh, but never uh, could have imagined what type of cooperation that we had with uh, Frank Holloman and J.C. McDonald with the police department and everybody that was involved. Same thing with Gregor Greer with the Tennessee Highway Patrol. We just had an incredible FBI. Uh, everybody jumped on board and uh, became a part of an incredible think tank. Advocates for making certain that uh, we did what didn't happen perhaps in Dallas. We want to protect the, the judicial system. We want to protect the accused so we made sure he had a fair trial. And uh, so everybody had a, a common vision of what we were going to be required to do uh, in as, as soon as he became a part of our system. What kind of pressure did you feel personally? You just mentioned Lee Harvey Oswald and then, you know, mm -hmm. Robert Kennedy was killed, you know, what, about a month and a half before this day when he came out. What, what was that like on you per personally well, to, to you make to, sure he you, was safe? You have to understand the world media was uh, had their eyes on Memphis to say, well, what's going to happen in Memphis, Tennessee? And of course, we had had some unfavorable publicity during that period of time previous to that about the backwater town comments that had been made by the national press. Uh, so it, the pressure was to make certain that we handle everything according to Hoyle. And uh, we had Judge Battle, Preston Battle, just a fantastic human being. Uh, he made certain that we, those of us involved, did our jobs and that we did not play to the press, that we just simply did our duties as uh, uh, law enforcement and protectors of the, of, the, of the system, so to speak. So it became such a strong partnership that even the University of Memphis, when we brought James Earl Ray in, provided us with the photographer. Yo Michael came and he took the picture that went worldwide because uh, we had heard, you know, large offers were being made for the first photo of James Earl Ray in custody. And we, Yo Michael made those prints and within a short period of time, those photographs were available to the world press. And of course, being the world press, it seemed like half of them were in Memphis, but they were 500 feet away from the jail by court order. So it was pretty interesting, uh, the process thought out well by a number of people and, and Charlie Holmes with the University of Memphis, uh, Memphis State at that time, was uh, his time was donated by Dr. Humphreys, who was president of the university. So you can see the totality of the corporation, all of the units that was required. As one person, just myself, I would have been uh, up the creek uh, if I had to do all of that by myself, but it was a, we had a good team out of my department and, uh, and all of us combined, it was quite an experience, experience to see how it could work. So he lands in Millington. Uh, was that, was that sort of plan to not have him land at Memphis airport and have him land on the military base? Was there a lot of thinking that went into where he landed in Shelby County? Interestingly, there was a lot of thinking and we did a few, uh, dry runs with people so that we kind of throw people off base about where he might be coming in. But everybody knew that he was going to be coming in sometime during that 24 hour period, not knowing that uh, he was going to be coming in at Millington, but Millington was chosen and I had the cooperation of the vice president and, uh, and of course the Pentagon. They made certain that if that's, this is what we want to do, they would make everything airtight on the base. I had choices of, three or four different places. And I lived in Southeast Memphis and everybody who was on the team appeared at my house about one o'clock and we re-gathered uh, at the substation uh, out east in East Memphis. Even then, no one but me at that point and the people flying that plane knew where it was going to go. And of course, about the, the appropriate time, the entire facility of the military base was absolutely created incommunicado. Nobody could call in, nobody could call out. Uh, here again, we didn't have cell phones, so we, that couldn't have worked. But anyway, uh, when we arrived, we went there in an entourage. We were there in a, an armored car that had belonged to the Mayor Thompson in Jackson, Mississippi. We borrowed it, had it in hiding up until the time we rolled it out to go to Millington. And of course, in, once we were on the plane, I read James Earl Ray his rights, and uh, there's a record of that, which I'm happy to 
to say that it was recorded. And at that time, we didn't record a lot. But anyhow, we did that. We redressed him, and Dr. De uh, MacArthur Demir gave him a physical examination. And we, boy, just like lightning, he was in that armored car and all the way to Memphis. Good thing that happened, we, we could have come into Memphis many different ways, but we just did the most uh, expedient way to come in. But when we got to the jail, we came in behind the jail, and uh, of course, media was everywhere. Someone leaked it. <laughs> well, no, they were just there all the time. Oh. Because they knew he was going to be there soon, but they never left their post. They were but when we came around to bend uh, in front of the courthouse behind the jail, we stopped the truck, and with that, there was a prison bus sitting there, and it was backed out, so it blocked the view of the cameras. And on top of that, there was a huge floodlight on the top of the, of the uh, Thompson's tank. They turned that light on, it flooded everybody. The light, you couldn't have seen hardly of the vehicle, let alone a person. And with just like that, we had him in, we had him out, we had him upstairs on the, on the floor where he was going to reside for the next several months and, and uh, without incident, without him being photographed except by our one photographer. And the uh, reason for that, you know, we all assume if you can take a photograph of him, you can shoot him. And we intended no one to be able to take a photograph. What do you remember getting on that plane and seeing him for the first time? What do you just remember about the interaction, seeing him face to face, eye to eye? Yeah, of course, there's a lot of intrigue. You know, I didn't know what to expect, uh, but it, it was a routine to, to me. Uh, we'd made arrests before, not not nearly as notable as this one, but uh, frankly, uh, I was not in awe of the situation. We just did our job, got on and off, went through the routine that we practiced. Had him out of there and and excited to have him in the jail and locked in on uh, what we thought was a, a horrific horrific crime and uh, and of course the sixes as you might recall history will reveal the sixes were turbulent years in the, uh, the entire country uh, with the assassination of Bobby Kennedy and John Kennedy and now King uh, so there was a lot uh, on the line to make sure this, this uh, was handled properly, or you might have a great deal more of that. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm sure that certainly must have been running through your mind at the time. Right. Um, um, what, what do you remember about the, going from Millington to the jail? Were you, did, were you in communication with him? Did you talk? Did he say anything? Well, he sat totally silent. And with him, uh, I had this Greg O'Rear, who must have weighed 300 pounds. He was head of the Tennessee Highway Patrol. He'd frighten you if you if you were to meet him in an alley. He's a big guy, but we all sat there. Uh, we had the Tennessee Highway Patrol involved. We had the FBI. We had the Justice Department, Police Department, and Sheriff's Department all represent inside that that Thompson's tank, and that's the way we kept him. We it was always not just one agency with eyes on him. We had Police Department, Sheriff's Department, and round the clock in the cell with him. Uh, all the time that he was in custody in Shelby County. And just to clarify, where, uh, what part, what part of the jail was he at uh, downtown? Was he on a certain floor? He was on the third floor. Like third floor. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Third floor of the current jail as yes, it is yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. What kind of extra uh, thing? Obviously, he was twenty four seven monitor. What right. kind of extra things went in for this particular prisoner? Well, of course, in uh, the first place, the bars that. Uh, you could see through the bars originally where the cell was, and there was light, and prisoners can see out. So we put plate steel over those bars on the outside <clears throat> that covered four different cells. So nobody would know which one he was in at any given time. <clears throat> Food was uh, a uh, box, metal box was created to hold three trays of food each meal. And the reason for that, the two officers and James L. Ray would be eating the same meals. And uh, when the food was prepared downstairs and the food was, box was locked, and then you take the, the food was taken upstairs to the jail cell area and unlocked, and James L. Ray had his choice of the one of the three, any one of the three, he'd take his tray, the other two officers would take those trays and they would all eat together. You know, there's always a possibility somebody would try to contaminate the food, so uh, we didn't take many chances on that. 
And what about the lighting? Uh, I, I would imagine something like a paper clip or something that could be a suicide or cutting. Uh, what kind of preparations were there inside that cell to, to, to triple, quadruple check to make sure there was no... It would have been that? very difficult for him to have done anything because, like I said, eyes were on him all the time. He had newspapers and magazines to read. And, uh, he had medicine to take and all of that, but it was, everything was, re was recorded. Uh, as we went along, uh, how much medicine he took, uh, what he had to say, how he felt, doctor's examination, all of those things, and a record was made of it, which still exists. And so we can tell you how many pills or what kind of pills and whatever it is, all the time that he was in custody. That might have been a little extreme, but it was an extreme situation. And it's better to go overboard than to be caught short. What do you, uh, in how, how, if between, I guess, when he, when he went off to the state custody in March of 69, uh, how many times do you think you talked with him between July 68 and March of 1969? Did you, did oh, you ever talk to him in the cell, or how often did you talk with him? I talked with him many times. More often than not, it was when he was in going into court, or uh, we were holding him to transfer him and what have you. I had no reason to have a lot of conversations with him. Uh, my job was to keep him in custody, keep him healthy, keep him available to go to trial, and so I didn't I didn't have the the curiosity to know him in particular well, but I did talk to him enough to get quite a few of his stories uh, about his life, and uh, and he was very conversant. Uh, it was not he was not unpleasant to talk with the times I had him, uh, but it was obvious to me he was a thug best I can put it. Uh, so were his family, for the most part, uncles, brothers, felon criminals uh, from Missouri. And, you know, so what do, what do you say? You, you've got a guy that's, you know, from a family, the crime was the, the daily dose of what they did. Uh, now that we have kind of 50 years to kind of look back on it, uh, does it, does, does it change to think how face-to-face -face you were with such a man that changed history? Uh, do you kind of take a step back now, 50 years later, and think any differently about those times you had with him? No, uh, I would rather think about uh, how much I was in awe of Elvis Preston, my friend. So I have more good thoughts about him, and I didn't worry about thinking about the negative things. The like negatives, that. right. Um, and so, um, and what did it mean, um, obviously, he, he was sort of out of your hands and Martin when he went into state custody. Yeah. What do you remember thinking at the time? Because obviously you, there was a lot of pressure on you to make sure things went, no incidents. Uh, what did it mean when he sort of left and Shelby County? I custody? think relief. Uh, that's the only thing I can say. Uh, our people had worked hard. They were always on, on, uh, on the watch for everything that could possibly go wrong. Now, once we handed him off over on the interstate, to the t uh, Tennessee Bureau of Prisons, uh, it was relief. I felt like we could come back and sort of let our hair down a little bit, get back to our routine of what we did, uh, and that is uh, providing Shelby County with the best law enforcement that we could give them, uh, including uh, crime prevention. When you look back on your legacy, your time as sheriff, public service career, county mayor, uh, where, where do you think those months kind of rank in terms of your most memorable moments and situations. Well, I, uh, I think uh, I'd have to say that would probably be the most memorable in that it, it, it uh, was such a worldwide event and historically significant. Uh, so what we did for those several months, that, that was a pretty major thing to deal with. And uh, fortunately for us, it worked out well and the accolades came from all the agencies, from Scotland Yard to Interpol to the Justice Department, J.S. Hoover, congratulating this city, not me, but the city, the way the city handled uh, not only James R. Ray, but the aftermath of James R. Ray. It was, it was done well. How needed was that, I guess, after the shock of the, the, the pain that Memphis felt after that? How, how, what did that mean to you to kind of have that go as smoothly as it could have? And get that recognition? Well, you know, uh, we needed to get back to business. Once James L. Ray was out of the picture, let the state deal with their deal, and of course he, 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 went, he, he went away and he came back, you know, uh, once, and so we had to go through that again, but not nearly so much as critical 
as the previous trip, because this was an appeals trip. Uh, but we didn't let that uh, change our motor uh, method of operation. So we still, once again, in our custody, no photographs, total security, in, out, handed off to the state, relief again. So that was the way it was. 50 years later, you're 85 now. I'm 37, you were 35 at the time. Do you take a step back and think, uh, wow, I was 35 years old and I was the sheriff of Shelby County and this was on my plate as a 35 year old? I have to tell you, I became sheriff at 31. So by the time, this was sometime later, we'd been through significant uh, uh, things that would uh, growing uh, experiences, uh, traveling around the nation, uh, uh, dealing with issues of national jail reform, working with the National Sheriff's Association, working with the state of Tennessee, and of course with, with the Memphis Police Department. But we had many experiences, and not the least of which, uh, first month I was in office, arresting one of our own deputies for murder. And, uh, and we had some terrible murders during the first four, three or four years that I was in the Sheriff's Department. Uh, one, one was a, uh, uh, similar to the Boston Strangler, uh, you know, that See person who killed. And, you know, confronting those people uh, that did brutal murders, to me, was more provocative in, in my trying to understand how would anybody, could they be that cruel? Uh, dismembering people, uh, burning a body out on Mitchell Road and Highway 61, a person was dumped into a barrel and burned. Uh, horrible murders, and you know, people uh, uh, disembodied and uh, thrown in the river, that, you know, all those kind of things. So you, you get pretty, pretty tough when you come face to face with those kinds of situations uh, a number of times. But we never became so callous uh, that we weren't sensitive to family needs and hurts and concerns and, and uh, so it, it wasn't, it was never easy to handle. But we had them in jail, uh, murdered people who murdered and uh, did horrible crimes. So our jail was a home place of much grief. Uh, and if you draw a caricature of everybody in that jail, most of the people were there for less minor crimes, you know, robbery, uh, that kind of thing, but you did have those that were truly bad dudes, if you would put it that way, and needed to be separated from society. Shelby County was not different than any other city. Uh, and even today, I think about, uh, we didn't have the violence at the level we see it in Memphis today. And we had a far different level of respect from the community for the law enforcement than we have today. We had a far higher level of community cooperation with law enforcement than I think you, we are experiencing in Memphis today, or maybe in the country. So it, that's a sad commentary, but uh, it's a part of the change of dynamics of law enforcement and, and uh, the community at large. What does this anniversary mean to you? 50 years is a pretty significant milestone, such an iconic day in your career. I, I, I'm happy to celebrate any day, 50 years, 40 years, what have you, uh, but a lot of, lot of water on the bridge since that time. And uh, uh, I am just thank God that I've been able to live this long. I have a large family, a wonderful family. I still, I'm engaged in my church. I'm engaged in my university. I still enjoy playing golf. I'm enjoying life. Though I live alone after the loss of my wife two years ago, uh, I live with her memories, and I live with uh, the thought that somewhere along the line, I think we made a difference in this city, and we feel good about that.